But I've got to wait a second for some equipment, I guess. Make sure we get the audio connected too. Hi, I'm Greg Collins. I'm head of design for NIT. Uh, I've met a lot of you, so that, uh, for people who are new, not nice to meet you. Um, so I, I, I chose 2030 as my target date. Interestingly, exactly the same date I not chose earlier. Uh, we didn't collaborate on that, but I, I think it's because that's a date that's uh, soon enough to be relevant, but uh, far away enough that nobody's going to remember what I said. So, <laughs> so I, I feel pretty safe here. All right, so training 2030. Um, so I'm going to start with a clip from a movie. Friends call me Flem. Uh huh. Mr. Bile, can you tell me what you did wrong? I fell down? No, no, before that. Can anyone tell me Mr. Bile's big mistake? Anyone? <coughs> Ugh. Let's take a look at the tape. Here we go. Uh, right. Ba -ba 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 -ba. There. See? The door. You left it wide open. Mm. Uh -huh. So. So that was for a movie, about 15 years ago, there was a Pixar movie, and uh, you know, the point was that uh, this putative job of scaring kids was very important. And so, and so the, the, I think that what the author was trying to do was to imagine the, the, the best training you could possibly do, if money were no object, for that, for that fictional job. Um, and as a training professional, I have to say, I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, that, that seems pretty close to what I would think would be the, the best possible way you could train somebody for that. And, and I, I found that although we have many, many different ideas about training, I, there's a lot of convergence when you ask people what's the best possible way you could train someone for a job. I mean, the, 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 the sort of the approach looks pretty similar. And we see a lot of it in real life in sort of specialized areas. You know, we see, look at the way pilots get trained on flight simulators. If you look at the way emergency responders get trained, if you look at the way athletes train, if you look at the way musicians train, look at the way astronauts train. Uh, in, in all those areas, there's something very similar. It's not the technology or the mode of delivery that's similar. What's similar is, is, is the, a situation that puts people in a realistic uh, environment in which they get very fast and very rich feedback on their performance. So, so one question to ask at, at the start here is, how does your training measure up to those kinds of examples? What, 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 what percentage would you say of the training that you deliver now is sort of on, on a par with that. Like, who, who would say 50, 40, 30, okay, 30, then 20, 10, 5, <laughs> 2, <laughs> okay. All right, so, so not so much. So, so we've tried to, um, first of all, characterize what makes those kinds of peak training experiences so good, okay? And we've come up with, uh, with a set of six factors. First of all is they, they have a mission. That is, if, if you're doing this kind of training, you're given something meaningful to do, something that resembles what you would be doing in the real world. Second is context, a realistic context. So, so, you, so you're given a, 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 it might be a simulation, it might be real life, it might be somewhere in between, but you're given a venue in which you can try to perform the, uh, the skill and carry out the mission. You're given challenges, which are the things that stretch your, you beyond the limits, of, current limits of your ability and cause you to, to increase your skill level. You're given choices on how to respond to those challenges. You get realistic, meaningful consequences when you make those choices, and you get coaching in the moment. So real coaching, co coaching that responds to what you actually did in a situation. So we, we've come up with a mnemonic for that. We call that E, e is in education equals MC5, okay? So we've done three factors better than physicists here. 
So, uh, um, does anyone know who that is? Very good. Yeah, so, so Anders Ericsson is, is probably the, uh, that makes me happy that we recognize Anders Ericsson. So he's probably the world's foremost expert in uh, the, the, this, uh, what he calls the science, uh, although we learned this morning that means it's not a science, but in the study of, of expertise, right? Uh, so he spent 20 years or more uh, looking at expertise in a wide variety of domains. And, and, and he's tried to characterize exactly what makes people experts. And, and if you're not familiar with him from his own book, uh, he's the person whose ideas are mostly the subject of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book, Outliers. So uh, what he summarized his work uh, under the heading of deliberate practice. So he says, the way you become an expert at anything, absolutely anything, no matter what the domain, is through deliberate practice. He has a fairly elaborate description of this, but a quick summary is it's practice that's realistic, it's goal-oriented, it's challenge-driven, okay? It's not mere practice for its own sake, it's driven to address specific challenges that you need to overcome, and it's coached. So, I, in other words, it's roughly similar to, to, to the factors that we've identified as being key to idealized training. So, Erickson is extremely, extremely um, excited about the prospect for improving performance if, if we could train everyone this way. So he said, deliberate practice can revolutionize our thinking about human potential. Imagine a world in which 50% of the people in every profession learn to perform at a level that only the top 5% manage today. So if we could do that, that, that would have an enormous impact on almost every profession. So, if we all sort of agree on what makes idealized training, why aren't we doing that? Well, you know, un unfortunately, most of our training looks a lot like it always did, which is somebody standing up and talking for however long, an hour as we heard before, 90 minutes. Sometimes, unfortunately, corporate training, it's eight hours or 24 in three days. So, um, well, but while that's going on, uh, there's been a technology-driven revolution that's going to eventually change everything about training. And the key to that revolution is a set of technology-enabled ideas that are going to overcome the barriers that have kept us from teaching the way we know we ought to be teaching. Okay? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what those barriers are and how, how we're about to overcome them. So the first, maybe most important barrier is simulation of the job context is just too expensive. All right? So, a great way to train people to, to fly fighter jets is to let them fly fighter jets. But it turns out the cost of crashing an F-15, or an F-18, sorry, is, is about $50 million. And it's assuming the pilot lives. Unfortunately, this one did. But um, that's pretty expensive. It costs about $25 million to run a full-scale battle simulation, like, like a number like the U.S. Army does in the California desert. It cost about $10 million to get a driving lesson in a Mercedes Le Mans car. Um, to, to get around that, Mercedes built a simulator that they claim cost $180 million. Even a simulator that's not quite so fancy is pretty expensive. And even at, at when at some point it became possible to make high fidelity simulations on computers, even those were pretty expensive for a very long time. So the Army paid about $5 million for a, a tank simulator that, that, uh, that, that, that it doesn't have physical components, but is a very realistic uh, sort of game experience. The, the technology that changed all that, that's going to change all that, uh, is called the game engine. Okay, so this, this comes out of the gaming community. A game engine is uh, a, a software environment that allows you to construct a 3D world and uh, animate it and put avatars in it. And the avatars can either be driven by AI rules or they can be driven by human beings. So if you have a learner, you can put them into a 3D environment, let them experience, it could be an oil well simulation, it could be a social simulation, it could be a simulation of almost any activity that you want. You know, it could be, you know, we, it could be medical simulations, it could be drilling platforms and so on. And we can do that for something more on the order of $100,000 instead of a million or 10 million. And, th and that's coming down. But we can go beyond that. So, so that gives you the ability to, to portray a world to the learner on a, on a screen, say on a, on a laptop or a computer. But we can use that same game environment to drive a virtual reality engine. And you see an exact example of that 
out in the lobby here if you want to see. So, so, th so this puts the learner in the environment, in the 360 degree version of the environment where when they move and they, and they gesture, those gestures and movements actually take them around the world to make things happen. But we can go even beyond that. So this is called a haptic suit. So, so this is sort of emerging technology, but it's, it's going to emerge very fast. So this is a suit that gives you physical feedback on, on a lot of areas of your body. So if you're doing a physical activity, you can actually feel something like the feedback you would feel if you did it in real life. And further, we have, uh, we have things like this. This is a, this is a, a surgery simulator. Okay, so this lets you have the experience of man, uh, manipulating a surgical Im implement with what's called proprioceptive feedback, which allows you to feel at a very fine grain level what it would feel like to manipulate, say, an actual scalpel. And that allows you to do virtual surgery. So you can manipulate little implements like that on a fairly realistic model of a, of a human body. Furthermore, we're, we've got to the point where we can uh, with uh, what's called a HoloLens that projects a hologram onto, the, uh, onto a real environment, um, it, it, we, we can give people an experience on the job or in a realistic environment that's, that's partly simulated. And we can use that same kind of technology, that sort of virtual reality, augmented reality technology, to get people together who aren't actually in the same physical space. So we can, so we can bring groups together to collaborate, to work on something, together in a, in, in a space that makes sense to them physically, but, but doesn't require them to actually fly to the same place and be together. All right, so all of that stuff together, all of those emerging technologies are going to make it possible to create realistic, highly realistic, uh, in, in, in immer immersive context for almost any kind of job environment or task environment we want by 2030, at least. Uh, the second barrier is even, though, even when we can create a simulation, a realistic simulation of somebody's job, we often don't know what the right challenges are. As we, we often don't know what we need to confront them with in order to make them ready to do the job. And that mostly is a problem with data acquisition if you think about it. So, so the, one of the older cliches in the book of training is that you've got frontline veterans who know what the real life challenges are, the things that you need to be able to overcome in order to actually get a job done in the field. But that information somehow doesn't make it into the classroom a lot of the time. Because it relies on sort of human networks that aren't well connected. And now this can be overcome with enough, with enough willpower and enough expenditure. So one, one example that I refer to ad nauseum if you know me, but uh, is that almost every government in the world goes out and investigates every single aviation accident or incident that occurs. And, and they do a deep root cause analysis of everyone. And all of that data gets analyzed and filtered down to uh, a, a list of exact requirements for pilot training. And that's one of the reasons why year after year after year, aviation gets safer and safer. It's an exponential improvement curve that has never stopped. And that's because the training is targeted on exactly the things that will make pilots fly better. Um, Toyota is a company that sort of overcame this uh, with a very simple thing. They, they had an idea called the suggestion box, which, uh, in which frontline employees would call out ways that the procedures on the front line could be improved. And that's an that's a incredibly simple idea. The, the, what Toyota did was drive this very hard. So they paid people based on how much their ideas improved the production process. And that, as you might imagine, made it very popular to, to submit suggestions. So they got literally millions of suggestions. They made tens of thousands of improvements over time. And that's credited as being one of the main reasons why Toyota was the world's sort of pioneer in high efficiency production systems. Because they made all these micro adjustments in their process based on frontline feedback. But most companies can't manage this. It takes a sort of special effort. But as, as we've heard a lot sort of yesterday and this morning, the thing that's going to change this is we're increasingly living in an environment that's networked together, that's digitized, where the data about frontline operations is able to be collected and can flow back to training. So we've got, we've got job environments where all kinds of feedback is being taken in real time, where, <coughs> excuse me, where, where there's video feedback, where there's feedback from um, frontline tools. And where the Internet of Things is, is poised to come in 
so that the very objects that you're manipulating and working with will actually report back. Pat talked a little bit about how airplanes now have this capability to, to relay information on the pilot's performance in real time. That's going to happen with almost everything we work with. So the net result of that is that we'll, get, we'll, we'll have the capability to get all this data, this network data, analyze it, and come out with very precise charts of exactly what the biggest challenges are in the front line for every role and every job. So we'll be able to do Pareto charts that say, what are the most costly, high impact mistakes that are getting made, not just historically, but right now. This can change in real time. So we can look at what are the top 10, what are the top 20 mistakes happening on every single job role anywhere in the world in my organization. And that makes it so that I can target training to exactly fix those mistakes. So I can keep, I can keep just like the aviation industry has done historically, I can keep improving my training so that I knock off the next tier of mistakes. All right, so the net result of all of that, automated performance tracking, audio video recording, frontline employee observations, facilitated through the network, and, and feedback through the, uh, starting from the Internet of Things, is to tell us what challenges learners need to confront in a, sim in a simulation of their job. So essentially, that's what that all boils down to. If, if you give me a simulation to work on, what exactly are the challenges that will have the most impact in preparing me for the real world? All right. Next point is, next barrier, is that access to training is limited. So Yorit talked about this a little bit. So when, when we do hands-on training, in many cases, both the access to the experts who run the training and the access to the equipment that people need in order to, to, to do the practice activities is very limited. So that's a big uh, wind turbine. That's a class sitting in front of it. The expert has, has flown in. All the students have had to fly in to get access to that expert and to practice on that machine. That costs a lot of money. And that means we don't do very much of it. Even simulators are, very, are, are itself bottlenecks. As you had said, these are very expensive. They're usually installed in only a few locations in the world. And people queue up uh, in order to get there. And they have to, again, fly in expert has to be there, and so on. Even software-only simulations are often location-constrained, and they often require an expert to facilitate working with them. So again, the ability to, to use a gaming engine to create a practice environment is, is going to change everything about this, because these, these gaming engines enable us to publish a simulation out to any device you can imagine all the way down to an iPhone. And so we can, put these on, uh, we can put these on tablets, we can put these on phones, we, can, we, we may be able to put them on watches in a few years. All right, so we can have people on the front line with the realistic simulation, practicing a skill, possibly at the moment that they need it, right before they're, they're going to do something. Fourth barrier, getting learners engaged, as we've talked about a lot, is hard. Okay? Well, in 1930, oh, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs, in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate. All right, so that's still the way we're training people most of the time in most of our activities. So it's, it's no surprise that there's a problem with engagement, right? Um, and unfortunately, when we started building e-learning, which maybe had the potential to change this, we often, we often mimicked what we did in the classroom. So, so even though we have a computer which has the power to create all kinds of experiences for somebody, what we chose to do with it was take a lecture, boil it down to bullet points, put it on, on the, the equivalent of PowerPoint slides, and deliver it so that the learner sits there and presses next until it's done. Often with the voiceover that, in fact, is the lecture that you would have been getting if you'd been sitting in a classroom. So that didn't help. And so you get this. So, so with a lot of the learning, the corporate learning that we deliver, you get learners who 
one way or another sleepwalk through it, and you get a lot of negative feedback. So if you actually ask people and, you know, and get serious answers, they, you find that they're not too happy about the, the training that they're getting. Meanwhile, the whole thing we call the internet has been going on, and as we've heard from many of the speakers up to now, all kinds of people everywhere in the world, total amateurs just doing this for the fun of it, more or less, uh, have created, have, have conspired to create all kinds of interesting content. You know, it's a, this is the content that your 16-year-old spends all day looking at, right? And, and it, it's not just, um, it, it's, it's not merely pure entertainment, a lot of it is in fact education, and, and we heard that before too. So, what's behind this is, is people are actually thinking about not just what's my content and how do I plant it in the learner's brain, but they're thinking about storytelling. Because storytelling is the way that human beings actually are able to, to internalize information. We don't internalize information well at all when people give us lists of abstractions. We do it when people tell us their story. And so, so, so what's happened, what's been facilitated by technology, oddly enough, is a, a new era of storytelling. Everybody is telling, their, telling stories to everyone else, and the best stories win out, and they become very popular and also very effective educationally. Perhaps the top of the pyramid of storytelling is, is game design. So, so, so gaming is an enormous industry. It's actually, I've heard it's a bigger industry than, than Hollywood, which, which sort of surprised me. So all the movies, all the Hollywood movies, you know, the, the, the net that they, uh, that they take into the box office doesn't equal the, the sort of uh, the total uh, revenue for the game industry. So in games, you not only have a storyline, you immerse the learner in it. So you have an interactive story where the learner is part of the action. Um, anyone know who that is? That's Seymour Papert. So Seymour Papert was a co-founder of the MIT Media Lab. He also was the guy who's responsible for Logo. So if you kids ever played Lego Logo, he's the guy who invented Logo. Um, brilliant guy. So, uh, so brilliant that way back in the 90s, he said this, the 90s, that game designers have a better take on the nature of learning than curriculum designers. They have to because their livelihood depends on millions of people being prepared to undertake the serious amount of learning needed to master a complex game. If the public failed to learn, they'd go out of business. Okay, so learning designers have a trove of really important knowledge that we need to be looking at as instructional designers because we have to get our learners engaged. We have, to get them, we have to get their eyes away from the internet and onto the learning experiences that we're trying to create for them. And one thing people often say to me is, well, you know, game designers get to do all kinds of sexy stuff like war fighting and so on and so forth, and you know, we have to do boring practical things when we build learning experiences. But if you let a gaming designer add something that would be considered boring and practical, they do something like this. So there's, there's a game called a farming simulator. It's very popular. There's an even more popular game which is based on making hamburgers. Okay? So, so it, it's, it's not the domain that makes it boring. What makes it boring is the attitude you bring to telling the story that you're trying to engage the learner in. So we have a lot to learn. Game designers are masters of, of, of frankly, all these things. Creating an interesting mission, crea creating a realistic context, putting challenges in front of the learner in the right sequence, in the right way, with the right escalating difficulty giving them choices, and possibly most of all, showing consequences. All right, so a few things that uh, are lessons from uh, instructional design, from learning design. One, emotion matters, story matters, freedom of action matters, rewards matter, hard is good, not bad, as we often think in learning community, and bad is good, by which I mean, sh if you're showing the consequence of a mistake, you, uh, you're better off showing a really big consequence than showing a little tiny consequence. Furthermore, in order to achieve this, we need to change our, our notion of, of instructional design. So we need to start embracing a real creative design process that looks like what you would do when you're creating a game that really creates a story that, that, thinks that, that considers not only what am I trying to teach, but what's going to get my audience engaged and, and what's going to make them feel like they want to continue and pursue this experience. All right, fifth barrier. Rote learning gets in the way of everything about learning. And in fact, you know, at, at, at some point, rote learning sort of was learning. So when you used to sit in a classroom, in fact, even the classrooms 
I said it when I was a kid, a lot of what you were doing was memorizing things. You're memorizing multiplication tables, you're memorizing the capitals of US states or, the, or all the countries in Africa and, and so on and so forth. Tons of time went into this and it still does. But, you know, a funny thing happened between my generation and my daughter's generation, which is the internet came along, Google came, the search engines, Google came along, Wikipedia came along, and now almost anything that we might have memorized in school, I can have it on my personal device in five seconds or less. You know, my, you know, my, my daughter thinks it's ridiculous when I show off the fact that I, I, I know all the capitals, for example. <laughs> like, give me a state, I'll tell you the capital. What's, what's the problem here? All right, and it goes beyond that. It's not merely the, the knowledge of isolated facts. Where the, the internet can organize facts for us. So I remember when I was growing up in New York City, my father was, was very highly thought of in the community because he had more or less memorized all the uh, subway stops and, and, and the different trains to take. So he was a fount of important information that was hard to get, right, otherwise. So, so now I simply have to get on Google Maps and I can punch in where I am, where I want to go. It gives me a, a, a long slate of options. I can say, when do I want to go? It says you can take this train, you can take that train, you can take this bus, that tram, whatever. Yeah, whatever. So, it, so it, it, it will organize information in a way that you can use it. Now, we're, we're able now to, to start to deliver that kind of information, not just on a personal device, but through augmented reality. So we can actually, we're going to be able to put that on, on a heads-up display let the learner get access to it as they do their job <coughs> with annotations and so on and so forth. So, so the, the, the important result of that is if we get rote learning out of training, we can spend the training time on stuff that actually matters, that is skill. So training is about skill, augmented reality will take care of the rote knowledge and that will give us much more time. Next point, next barrier is coaching. Coaching is, is Incredibly important to development of skill, but unfortunately it's expensive. So real coaching from an expert human coach in the moment costs a lot of money. I don't know if that's actually coaching going on, but that's the closest thing I've found to a picture there. But now again, we can put people in a virtual environment where they can coach each other without having to be in the same place. We can use augmented reality to give people, as they call it in the, the arts, notes on their performance as they go, right? So imagine having an expert who's maybe in a, low, in a remote environment, can watch what you're doing, can give you a quick note, say, hey, saw what you did there, maybe you want to think about this and this next time. We can project humans into physical environments using robotics. We can use actual robots. So we can use, again, we heard about this before, we can use, uh, we can use robots as coaches in, in some cases where they have enough ability to give feedback and they're probably, more patient than, at least, than human coaches. Finally, continuous improvement of our training. How to get our training to actually deliver the best possible outcomes. Again, think again about all the, uh, all the data that we're, gonna, that we're able to collect to go into the construction of the training. That same data allows us to check whether the training's effective. So if we compile a list of mistakes, we build training that's designed to uh, to knock those mistakes out of the system, we go back and measure and we see this mistake is still happening. Guess what? We know that the training component that was meant to fix that is not working right. And on top of that, we can get, and uh, th this is, uh, we, we, can, we can actually use neuroscience to measure human reactions to the training. So not only can we measure whether the training is effective at the front line, we can measure how people receive it, whether they're paying attention. And I just found this really funny that uh, I actually used the same exact diagram that Anand explained to you earlier, so, so that we can get sort of data on how uh, using sort of portable EEGs, we can get data on how people are reacting to training. So he explained that, so I won't. All right, so finally, so what will training look like in 2030, given all this? First, we'll provide accurate immersive simulations for every job kind. Automated network-based data collection and analysis will drive the design of learning scenarios for those uh, uh, for those simulations. Training will be available anywhere, anytime on personal devices, including, uh, including um, uh, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality devices. Learning will use interactive storytelling techniques of game designers for maximum engagement. 
Augmented reality devices will eliminate the need for rote memorization. Just-in-time coaching will be available to every learner all the time. And network-mediated data reporting analysis will facilitate continuous improvement of training effectiveness. So given all this, I think we can realize Anders Ericsson's dream. And not only that, we can do that for about the cost that you're currently paying for run-of-the-mill e-learning. Thank you.